If you've ever seen photos of atomic clocks or space satellites, you're probably not thinking about all of the machine components that go into making these devices. It's incredible to think that every small piece, every metal cog or bolt, was probably handcrafted by an instrument maker. Now, not all scientific devices are custom built, but for institutions with their own instrument shop, like Jilla, most of the laboratory equipment is specially designed and hand created by a team of instrument making experts. As long as Jilla has been around, since 1962, it's had its own instrument shop. Here, six instrument makers, who you'll get to meet throughout this episode, work diligently to ensure Jilla scientists have the precisely made optical cavities, laser arrays, or other devices needed to produce some of the world's most cutting edge physics research. Because Jilla is one of the few institutions in Colorado with such a big instrument shop, the shop serves other organizations besides Jilla, including the National Institute of Standards and Technology, or NIST, several departments at the University of Colorado Boulder, and even some industry partners. If you walk through the instrument shop, a series of connecting rooms on the first floor of the B-Wing, you'll be immediately hit with a cacophony of sounds. There is never a dull moment in the instrument shops, as instrument makers tag team on various projects that take months, sometimes years, to complete. As you'll hear, each instrument maker has their own specialty, and all of them see the shop as a type of studio to play around in and learn new techniques. The instrument shop also hosts a staff section where anyone can come in to make something unique or learn a specific skill like soldering. While not officially announced, the instrument shop also has helped many students with basic bike repairs, showing their capacity to help the larger Jilla community. Currently, Jilla has six instrument makers. Its head, Kyle Thatcher, along with experts Hans Green, Adam Elzey, Kim Hagen, Calvin Swadron, and James Urich. Don't worry if you didn't catch all their names. You'll meet most of them as we continue our tour through the instrument shop. As we move through the rooms, it might be best for you to close your eyes and imagine you're with me, interviewing these experts as they sit at their workbenches, surrounded by decades-old lathe and other equipment still used today. As you'll find from our tour, sometimes the best methods for making an instrument the right way are the oldest. This is the story of Jilla's instrument shop. You're listening to Humans of Jilla, a Jilla podcast focusing on the human narrative of the institution's researchers. I'm your host and science communicator, Kenna Hughes Castleberry. Every month, I tell the story of a researcher or group within Jilla showcasing the human sides behind the science. If you enjoyed today's episode, please like it on our YouTube channel or follow us on Spotify, and be sure to share it with your friends and family. This episode features a series of interviews with Jilla's instrument makers. As these interviews took place in the many rooms of the instrument shop, you'll hear various noises common to the environment, giving you an inside look into what's happening within this creative space. While not all of Jilla's instrument makers were interviewed, the ones that were shared similar experiences and motivations for their beautifully made work. Let's begin our story. We'll start our tour by speaking with Kyle Thatcher, the head of the instrument shop. You can typically find Kyle sitting behind a workbench in the glass shop. Today, he's been busy working on a couple of smaller projects and points to the stool across the workbench for me to sit on. Well, my first question for you was like, how did you get here? And kind of, could you tell me a little bit about your journey to the instrument shop? Yeah, yeah. so um, I came here via engineering. Um, I grew up in Virginia, in a little town of Blacksburg, which is Virginia Tech, so another college town. There aren't many options in Virginia. There's like Tech or UVA. And since I grew up, I didn't really like UVA. My sisters went there. No siblings. Right? <laughs> I didn't want to go to school where I grew up, you know, just stay in town. So I started looking elsewhere and uh, landed in Boulder because they had a good engineering program. So uh, I went through engineering to mechanical. And while I was a student, I got pretty involved in the engineering shop. So I worked for them for a while. It was, you know, relevant to my senior design built a, a hyper mileage vehicle from scratch just like a competition and yeah and so uh i had a my my good friend we were each other's best man and whatnot he was uh, getting his phd here so we were an undergrad together he was in dana anderson getting his phd and he's like hey there's this shop and you know he was working at Hans, and he was like i think you'd really enjoy it and they take students and 
So I uh, uh, came and talked to Hans and started working here as a student worker. Did that for two years, I guess. And then, yeah, when I was graduating, I was looking at different prospects. And, you know, typical engineering work, engineering jobs are very... Uh, sit in front of the computer and design CAD all day and you never get to see or touch anything being made and that didn't excite me very much. And so Todd, who was the former head of the shop, offered me a position and thought that sounded great. So I came in and did the apprenticeship. So I went through the apprenticeship program. So yeah, it's an 8,000 hour, it's a four year roughly if you don't take any vacation. Um, <laughs> if you just live in the shop. If you just live here, yeah. Yeah. Um, apprenticeship and so yeah I completed that and have been working for you know a number of years just as a instrument maker in the shop and then during COVID I retired and kind of put me forth as the a good option and talked about it. and she was like sure you want to run the shop and I was like I, I guess so so here I am yeah I love uh, that's that. my that's my trajectory so. so what does it take to run the instrument shop then what does that entail oh, what does it take to run so it's uh, a lot of well not very much in terms of the staff. So mm -hmm. all the all the guys are great. You know, there's very little managing of them, right? So we all pretty independent. We're all self sufficient, and you know, projects come in from fellows or from grad students, and uh, we each own our own projects. So you know, you kind of do it start to end. So in terms of that, it's it's pretty uh, hands not I don't want to say hands off, but I, you know. They're good. They're good. Yeah. <laughs> so on my side, it's a lot of uh, dealing with everything else. So, you know, um, trying to schedule jobs, communicating with NIST and working with outside groups on jobs. What we can do, like in industry, if there's, you know, we're not allowed to compete in the market, being state funded and all of that. But, you know, there's certain things that we do here that you just can't get anywhere else. So it's true. We do a lot of work with outside industry as well, interfacing with them, managing the apprenticeship program. So working with the government on that and all of everything that entails and trying, you know, to, to, to steer the shop. So looking kind of towards the future, what capabilities that you might need and, you know, getting money and funding and things for buying equipment. And this past year actually we got a, uh, it wasn't just, I mean, I don't do this alone, but and, and all the admin staff in jail obviously yes. uh, help a ton. So, um, but we got a uh, congressionally directed funding grant, so like a bunch yeah. of money from the government to buy equipment. So going through all of that, time sheets, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> time sheets, <laughs> signing off everyone's yeah. hours. Signing off hours yeah. So how big is the apprenticeship program this year? Just, just Adam. Just yeah, Adam. We, we typically only have one, maybe two, depending. Okay. So Calvin also went through the apprenticeship, and he and I overlapped a little bit. He just started right as I was finishing. So what sort of things do you do in the glass shop here? Yeah, so I, uh, at some point, kind of got put in charge of the special techniques glass area. Okay. So this was originally called the tube lab. Tube lab. Yeah, so back when physics used a lot of vacuum tubes. For, like, you know, early computing. Before, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we would make custom vacuum too so and, and they're still used there's a lot of uh, like ion gauges and things that sure. are kind of the same technology you still you know it's vacuum you still use like evaporative getters and different like ion dispensing cells within experiments so that's kind of the bulk of how the glass shop kind of evolved and over time just added extra capabilities so we have like annealing ovens and furnaces we do some heat treatment we have a little you know special like right now i'm coring some mirrors so oh wow someone had a spherical mirror that they needed smaller for their uh, experiment making this little tiny cavity whoa and so cutting down glass yeah plating services so we do gold plating and nickel plating That's and right. that sort of stuff um, along with some polishing so we have some optical polishing machines so we do um it can polish glass and metals too but mainly harder things so do you have a favorite thing that you'd like to work on so I, I do really enjoy the design side of stuff. That's okay. probably my, my uh, if you want to call it an expertise or whatever, yeah. again, going through engineering and kind of having that whole background in design. So I'm happy to work on CAD. I enjoy, uh, you know, problem solving on the computer. I just don't want to do it all day, yeah. every day. You want to get out and get your hands dirty. Yeah, exactly. So it's really nice. That's actually the best the, the most enticing thing about instrument making is that you design and build. So yeah. about half your time, you're actually designing stuff, you're working through problems, and then the other half, you get to make them. Make your <laughs> the little colored models on the computer screen into real objects. 
Do you have any particular kind of advice for somebody who might want to, like, use the instrument shop? Yeah, I guess my biggest part or my biggest piece of advice that I try to give new Jillings when they come is to come talk to us first. You know, a lot of times you'll, you'll get in here and you'll get all excited and there'll be some new experiment you want to get running or something you need made. And you could take a ton of time and effort and learn CAD and work through a design and try to solve it yourself, which is totally fine. I mean, you, you'll learn a lot doing that, too. It's not the most efficient. <laughs> so yeah. coming to us, uh, we have this background. We've probably made what it is you're trying to come up with or something similar to it in the past. We have a lot of experience there. And so really coming to us at the very beginning when you just have an inkling of an idea or a napkin sketch or whatever that is, letting us help kind of steer you in the right direction because there's a lot of pathways you can go down that are dead ends. And we've seen those dead ends. Don't That's, want to waste anybody's time. <laughs> yeah, and you know, I and I get it. It's it's especially if you really like it. By all means, you know, learn SolidWorks and 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 design up your own stuff and draw it up. And we also, I mean, there's a staff shop as well, so where yeah. anyone in Jilla can come and and make things themselves, and we encourage that, obviously. And so, if you are interested in it, by all means. Feel free to do it all yourself, but but use us as that resource. You know, we're, we're here to answer questions. We're here to help guide you through that process. Some people lean on us a lot more, which is totally fine, and some less, which is also fine. I know when I interviewed Calvin last week, he said COVID kind of created an influx of projects for you guys because people were thinking more about what they yeah. wanted to build. Yeah, when everyone whatnot. was at home, they had nothing to do but ponder new new ideas and <laughs> yeah. new, new projects they wanted to make. So yeah, it got real busy there. Plus without having everything made while we were gone as well, because we can't take machines home. No, <laughs> no, you can't. Yeah, um, yeah we, other things weren't getting done either. So yeah, that was definitely a big jump in work when we came back. Yeah, has it slowed down at all? Do you notice that it's going to go yeah, back we, up? We've or? caught up a bit. Jilla generally kind of goes in cycles. So sometimes we'll get really, really busy, and then sometimes it kind of tapers off a little bit. And I'd say that the moment it feels like we're in a slight taper but there's always stuff coming in so you know we're, we're at the moment you know the queue's only like a month long instead of six months <laughs> so yeah that's awesome yeah. what do you kind of have planned for this week as far as projects that you're working on let's see everyone generally you have three four five different things that you're working on all at the same time yeah so i'm playing catch up from last week or, or the week before when i was out sick. So yeah, just getting some little things done. I don't have anything too big on my plate, but again, as manager, I like to sort of sit in on on some of the bigger projects and mm -hmm. kind of like design reviews, we call them. And so again, lending that, that design expertise, I guess, kind of at the beginning along with artists and makers as well. So I kind of have my fingers in a lot of different things, but I, I, you know, I, I maybe don't get to make as much as, as I used to, of course. Again, the Managing everything takes some time, and so I, I typically don't get these sort of large, big, ongoing because I just I don't want to be the bottleneck. So yeah, that's I'll fair. take on some little things here and there. And with that congressional spending, uh, we got a new machine, so we got this five-axis. Yeah. Mill. So I have this. Uh, I have one part for someone in last goes on a sounding rocket. Anyways, that's pretty complicated. That should kind of test out this five-axis machine and give me an opportunity to learn it a little bit because I haven't programmed in wow. five axes yet either. So and yeah. none of us have. So <laughs> it's new to us. Yeah, we're always trying to trying to learn, trying to increase our capability. Yeah, and it sounds like also modernize a little bit mm -hmm. too as, as things move up, as the technology kind of gets yeah. better. Yep. Bring that in. Yeah, that's one of the hardest things I think here is keeping up with the old technology. So there's a oh. lot of things that do require, you know, old techniques like the glasswork, you know, like this, these um, vacuum tubes and things. But as that tapers and as we do less and less and less of it, every time it comes in, it's harder and harder to to remember how it was done or, or have that, you know, the glass particularly is... Um, almost like an art very finesse it's very you know it's not it's not like regular machining where you know everything's more or less straightforward i, I feel like there's also a finer line of error like margin of error you have with the glass yeah yeah definitely it's it can be challenging yeah it likes to crack <laughs> i'm sure <laughs> likes, i'm sure yeah to break on you when you least expect it yeah well my last question mm -hmm. for you kyle is more of just kind of an overall broad question which mm -hmm. i've asked 
the other guys, but more of just like what has been kind of your favorite part working here, working at Chilla? What do you most enjoy about this space? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot I enjoy about working here. I think first and foremost is just the people. You know, again, all the instrument makers, our admin staff, our review, we just have excellent people here at Jilla. So that's really nice. It's really refreshing. I, you know, I took a little longer through school. I took a break and went and did work in industry and had some good experiences, but also some bad experiences. And it made me realize how, how nice it is to have this type of community where everyone is, you know, open-minded and always wants to learn new things and, you know, isn't, like in trouble saying it, not necessarily, <laughs> like, focused on the bottom line, you know, the, yes. how yep. much things cost and how quickly you can get it done, but really just want the best product. I move from the glass shop deeper into the B-Wing, where I walk through a small break room into a bigger room full of lathes and saws. On my right are a series of small workbenches, each with a glass barrier to delineate who works where. Upon my entrance, I'm given a pair of safety goggles, which will protect my eyes, just as my closed-toed shoes, required for the instrument shop, protect my feet. Here, I meet James Urich, one of Jilla's instrument makers. He's bent over a lathe, dating back to 1963, as he later tells me, a year after Jilla was founded. While the lathe looks outdated, Urich assures me it works like a charm. As he bends over the lathe, Urich zeroes in on a small piece of metal, it's a last-minute request from a research group. Can you make us yeah. one in stainless now? I said, oh, okay. When do you want it? This afternoon, so dropped everything to get this done for you. The metal piece Yurik is working on is called a standoff ring, which is used by researchers to test thermal conduction abilities. As he tells me, the researchers hope to get some measurements later that day, which means the ring needs to be finished rather quickly. Over the wine of the lathe, Yurik explains how he coats the ring with water and a bit of oil as a coolant. Water is a great coolant. However, it does gunk up the machines, giving the undergraduates a rather fun chore to tackle later. They do get gooey, and um, they get a nice crust and goo oh, built up on them. That's why we hire undergrad students to scrub all the machines. If you ask Calvin, that's how he started. I just got to scrub stuff all day long. And he um, never wanted to leave. Yeah, exactly. He's like, oh, I love this job. Totally beats washing dishes uh, or whatever. Yurik then transitions to explaining how the process of building an instrument in the instrument shop works, starting with a design concept. And her conversation quickly evolves from there. Sometimes we get more than enough information. Sometimes it's like, well, we'll come back because we don't know what we want. And okay. uh, this time it was kind of in the middle. She's like, I have a photo yeah. of what we want. Oh, that's so handy. We modeled it up really quick. And this is an incredibly simple part. But okay, um, the nice thing is if they need to change it, they can make another one pretty fast. How? What's kind of been the weirdest thing that you've had to make based on like no information? There have definitely been groups they'll say can you make this thing for us we need it right away but they have no idea what they really need and so okay. there's a lot of like back, and, back forth. and forth trying to coach them through like have you thought about this did you think about that and it really is just a different mindset like okay. kind of teaching researchers who might be new here or trying to find their feet here like this is kind of how you approach it point a to point b how do you get there? How do you get there efficiently? Do you guys have like a guidebook? So if somebody comes in, they're like, I'm looking for this piece. You can be like, look at this guidebook and um, see the pieces we kind of make. That's a great question. Hmm. We call the Bible right here. The Bible. The Bible Yurik refers to is called the Machinery's Handbook, which has a long and rich legacy. For Yurik, who is a father to a young child, the handbook provides a nice soporific for his baby. It's a classic text. How um, old is this? You know, these started, I think... These were published original. Let's see when the original copyright was. There are many versions of this. The original one was 19. 1914, and this particular one is 75. Okay. But they change each time, so there are eras that are like oh. the choice eras. Okay. Because they were focused on an area in the the reference material that was pertinent to the day. So you'd like the 75? Is yeah. there anything particular in there that sticks with If you with need you? to go to sleep. <laughs> everything in here it's the perfect cure for insomnia i mean here's a whole how many pages on wing nuts I, it is thick yes there's a lot involved but we so here's a funny one now before i came to jilla i had no idea this even existed so 
there's what's called RMS thread or Royal Microscopical Society thread. Oh wow! From England, of course. Of course. It's royal, yeah. and it has its own very specific things. And it's this is from the 1800s when they yeah. were making their micro microscopes out of brass and still use these standards today. Really. They make taps and stuff out. Like you okay. can buy this stuff from Thor Labs. Um, wow. But it's kind of funny how these archaic, like yeah. for example, this is what's called a 55 degree thread, which okay. is an old English stand really that old. nobody else uses today. Everything's okay. 60 degrees now. No, they, they needed 55 degrees. Oh my gosh. So we have special tools ground to 55 degrees. It's kind of yeah. funny, but that's my one uh, note in here that I, I always like that. have to look up. For now, do you read your baby this Bible? Yeah, she, she loves it. <laughs> she loves it. She you're, always asks for it. You're Can starting you up early. a section on gears, please? <laughs> <laughs> So do you have a particular specialty you enjoy doing? Somebody asked me this the other day, and I was like, yeah, I kind of like welding. So I've welded since I was a kid, but it was kind of the messy welding. It's like, oh, Farmer John brings in his tractor, and you need to hack it all apart and fix their bad welds. That's kind of what I was used to doing. Um, but here it's very clean, yeah. like vacuum welding and things for chambers, and, and it's challenging. Getting oh, sure. vacuum tight seals, everything aligned geometrically. It's for some reason when people bring in vacuum chambers that usually lands on my desk, I get to do that. <laughs> and I've saved a reject one here. This oh, is a that's catastrophic great. failure. This is my shelf of shame, in fact. All Your the, shelf of shame. Yeah, all the all the projects that either the design wasn't correct or I screwed something up. Sometimes we find tools in the staff shop that put in a bin like can you guys resharpen this and it's an <laughs> end all that has some material wrapped around it oh never to be used again in its life yeah you can't save that yeah so do you keep your shelf of shame then just to remind you of how far you've come or just to remind me that we're all human take it easy it's not a big deal you're probably going to screw something up are vacuum chamber chambers your favorite thing to make then I'd say they're one of the more challenging ones that I, I do enjoy that challenge. I like, I, I would say if I were to kind of give an overview of what I like about working here versus other jobs I'd had in the past doing very similar stuff, the variety of materials oh, that we get to work with and the variety of reasons for making this stuff is really cool to me. So it doesn't really matter what comes in the door. It's for some really cool experiment. I love hearing like, oh, this is going to do that, and can you guys modify this thing or make this thing from scratch to make the next atomic clock? Do you ever, like, when you see the news and you see something about, like, atomic clocks or something, do you ever, like, have some sort of pride knowing, like, my, my work's in there? Yeah, I mean, it's always enjoyable to see some kind of uh, uh, an output of the work that you put in. That's awesome. So what else do you have going on this week besides um, this? So... <laughs> Stainless this steel. is the full range that you're going to get in the, in the instrument shop. So we do everything from very specific little complex parts. I have another job coming in making a little tiny microwave cavity essentially out of alumina, which is a type of ceramic. Wow. And we have a special machine that uses diamond cutters to cut this alumina ceramic and make it essentially the size of a sugar cube. This little, little white six-sided cube that um, a group in engineering actually has us doing and we've done a lot of work for this group and they're always doing some challenging small whether it's silicon or glass or alumina in this case some non-metallic material that's wow. really cool so that's one end of the spectrum yeah. the other end of the spectrum is like going into a lab and setting up shelves for them. Like, hey, we need some more storage for all of our cardboard boxes. And one day it might be doing this really, really intricate little thing that's a tough, uh, you know, design challenge and manufacturing challenge all the way to <laughs> having to like reach over someone's pile of garbage <laughs> to like hang a shelf in their lab. So, yeah. so is, is the alumina and the ceramics and glass particularly hard to work with then since it's not your usual? Yeah, yeah. I would say that's an area like glass work in general, like hot glass work. Oh. I have zero experience in that. Um, so I'm much more of a subtractive type manufacturer. Sure. Yeah. Stuff. After speaking with Yurik, I scoot down a couple of workbenches to where Adam Elzey is speaking with a researcher about the design of a small electrical component no bigger than the tip of someone's finger. 
they're trying to find this component's details, or specs, online with little luck. We've got some little electronics connector here that's got some non-standard thread pitch to it, and we're just Google searching here on where we can find these, and surprisingly... Uh, can you find them? I don't have any idea. How would, how would you even describe that in a Google search? That's my well, question. Well, yeah, so so the thread pitch, uh, there's, uh, for, for metric threads, there are uh, okay. two measurements that, that you need okay? for it. Sure, yeah. So the diameter of the thread and then the distance oh, from peak to peak. This is a metric thread, so this happens okay. to be what's called an M9, so it's 9 millimeters in diameter. Mm -hmm. And 0. 0.6 is the distance from peak to peak. Okay. And yeah, this is like some weird. We said it was a Swiss company. Yeah, it's a Swiss that? company which makes these elect electric connectors. We're the only ones in Gillette who use them. So, so yes, I, I don't know what to tell you other than just do what I'm doing. Okay, here. that's fine. Practice your Google foo and see if you can. Yeah, I'll go back and look at the search but... order too, and I'll see if uh, I can just get the nuts. But I think they do this just to torment us and spend fifteen dollars a head. Awesome. Really? For that, the nuts. That's ex it, that expensive? Yeah, this is like fifteen dollars oh. a pop. They're really yes. nice. If they work, yeah. And yeah, they're okay, really nice. Enough. We love yeah. them, but okay. <laughs> it's, it's a love-hate relationship. Yeah, of course. Cool. So yeah, appreciate it. Do you mind if I steal a few minutes of your time? Sure. Okay. Of course, yeah. So James was telling me you're an apprentice. Could you maybe talk about yeah. how you came here? Yeah, totally. So the whole, the whole story is kind of silly. When I was an undergraduate, I was working with some students on, uh, we were working on a project investigating the physics of slinkies. And slinkies. And slinkies, yep. Okay. And so we were walking around physics building Jilla looking for some appropriate stairs for some slinkies to go down. <laughs> and uh, we happened to be walking through the hallways of Jilla, and who else but Hans also happens to be wandering around. Okay. And, uh, you know, so it was obvious that we were kind of searching around stuff. He's very good at being in tune with, you know, yes. people yes. and their needs and things. And so he asked us, you know, what are you guys doing? And so, we, yeah, we told him, and he spent an hour with us maybe on like if we could find stairs if we could make some stairs simply there's a whole pile of bricks out in the loading dock he like crawled under this little cubby thing and he pulled out all these bricks for us and i don't actually remember where that project went but yeah so i just got talking to hans and asked him about the shop here he gave me a tour this was really cool i had kind of a tangential familiarity with machine shops and stuff but not much i was a physics student at the time and just got chatting with him, really excited about this work. He said that they hired students, wow. and um, I kind of forgot about it. A month or two went by, yeah. and uh, my girlfriend at the time, now my wife, I had uh, encouraged me to come back in and talk to Hans. And, you know, I had told her it was pretty cool. I was pretty excited about it, but I didn't really do much. And then, yeah, so Hans said they hired students. He hired me as a student, uh, doing just kind of, you know, menial tasks, hanging shelves, uh, maintaining machines, that kind of stuff and really fell in love with the work. And then in 2019, I got hired as an apprentice. So yeah, a couple of the other guys had retired. Timing just worked out really well. And then it was like every month I was like, hey guys, I want to do this. I want to be an apprentice. <laughs> and finally they're like, all right, fine. You know, you can do it. So yeah, it's kind of the rest of history there. So I'm currently an apprentice. Uh, it's a four-year apprenticeship. And it'll probably be about five when I finally finish. You know, COVID happened, had a kid, you know, delays here and there. So, so yeah, I mean, it's, so it's 8,000 hours. There's about 2,000 hours in a work year. Okay. So it ends up being, you know, four years. Four years. Yeah. Uh, I'm at about 6,500 hours right now. Oh, my goodness. So I'm getting there. Yeah. You know, closer to graduation every day. Uh, I'll get an actual okay. diploma hanging above my physics diploma at home. It's going to be pretty yes. cool. I'm excited about that. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, totally. So, uh, yes, yeah, so that's, that's, yeah, that's how I, I found the place. And so what sort of does an apprentice do versus, like, an, an instrument shop? Uh, so everything the same. The the uh, the title really just goes with the pay. So, so yeah, yeah so I'll, I'll get paid more. I guess we're excited, of course, for obvious reasons. But yeah, I mean, I'm doing the same stuff that everybody else is doing. The assumptions, I guess, is, is that, you know, I'm asking more questions. I'm spending more time, gotcha. you know, shadowing people, you know, when I finally graduate. There's just, yeah, kind of a, a responsibility shift. You know, obviously, I mean, we're all always learning you know, every day since we do one-off parts. It's new stuff. Yeah. And so it is always collaboration, always learning from each other. But, uh, but yeah, like I said, there's just some kind of expectation change once I finally finish. That's awesome. So, yeah. Do you have a particular favorite thing you enjoy doing? That's a really hard question to answer. Okay. Because, uh, no, honestly, all of it, yeah. I mean, what's really amazing is that because we do so many different things, you know, I'll, I'll be working on the lathe for, you know, a week or two, and then 
work on another project on other machines. I won't go back to the lathe for another month and a half or something. And then when I'm finally back, it's like, oh, sweet, I'm on the lathe again. You know, it's all so different and it keeps every machine fresh. If I was working on a lathe all day, every day, I'd probably get a little bit tired of it. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, like I say, because it's always different. Yeah, it keeps it really fresh and exciting and, and, and just enjoyable. So it's like I say, it's hard to find a favorite because it's just, it's all kind of fun and, and there's so much variety in everything we do. I heard James mention welding and I, I feel pretty similarly. I really enjoy welding. I'm not anywhere as good as he is. And just this morning, you know, I was uh, working on a welding project. I haven't done anything with the welder in six months or a year, maybe. Sure. So I'm doing some test pieces, kind yeah, of refreshing myself, kind of remembering how it all goes. It didn't go so well. I'm going to do a couple more practice pieces and, you know, before I go ahead on the real thing. Uh, but yeah, it's fun. Yeah. Do you have like a particularly like strange project that you've worked on or one that maybe you didn't expect to work on that you're like, this is kind of challenging and fun and cool? Yeah, I, again, it's hard to choose a single, a single one. I will say yeah. many projects that I get when I see the part, I see the design, I think to myself, I can't make that. Like, there's no way, you know, just like eat an elephant, a bite at a time, a yeah. little bit here and there and finally get through it. And then weeks go by and it's like, holy crap, I made this part. I'm curious how I'll feel in like 10 years once I've like really gotten through stuff. And honestly, I'm just now getting to the point where I'll see a part and it's like, I think I could maybe make this, you know. Right. The imposter syndrome is kind of starting to wear yeah, off. Yeah, so yeah, you've that, got that experience. Yeah, exactly. That comes with, yeah, time and experience. So. That's awesome. If, if somebody from a group came in and said, I need a part for a machine. Got it. But they weren't entirely sure what they were looking for. Mm -hmm. Would you like walk them through like how that would look or like try to go back and forth with them on like trying to figure out what they need or look at their lab? Or... Yeah, I mean, kind of standard questions are like, what are you trying to do? You know, people okay. come in, it's like, hey, how can I machine this thing? And it's like, well, hang on, let's step back a minute and think about, yeah. you know, what are your real goals with the project? And oftentimes there's other solutions, other ways to do it, quicker and easier things. You know, of course, I can't think of something off the top of my head right now, but, but it's, it's <laughs> okay. really trying to get a, a bigger picture. You know, the scientists spend so much time on the science that when they're trying to make something mechanical or something to, you know, mate with the part that they have in their experiment, it's easy to kind of get tunnel vision, you know, and it's like they want this thing to do exactly this. Yeah. And so part of our expertise in the shop is to say, you know, hang on, let's put the brakes on this and let's step back and kind of get a bigger picture of what it is that you're trying to do. And because we see this stuff all the time, you know, somebody's going to come in and they need a problem solved, that they have a solution, but we already have a solution because, you know, once a week somebody's coming in with right. the same problem and we're like, right. oh, hey, here's a much better way to do this, yeah. much easier way to do this. Plumbing things is a really common thing people come in with, oh, different yeah. fittings, and there's such a wide range of, yeah. you know, they, they have chillers, so they have cooling water that goes to some <laughs> instrument, they need a, you know, temperature control or whatever. And it's always a puzzle to solve, to figure out, you know, some chillers yeah. got some size, and then what we have in our stock is a totally different standard for size. And so, you right. know, going from one thing to the other can be really challenging without experience. Um, but again, people come in with these challenges all the time. And same, same thing like I was saying earlier, like I'm just now getting to the point where somebody comes and asks me that question. And I'm like, oh, I think I can handle this. <laughs> I, think <laughs> I, know awesome. the, I think I know the answer. So, or at least places to look and, uh, you know, different websites to go to that have, you know, stocks of different parts and things. Um, McMaster Car is actually what I have open here. They have a huge range of different, you know, plumbing fittings and air fittings and stuff like that. So, so yeah, it's a, it's a huge, huge range of stuff, but it's a pretty long-winded answer. No, no, no. <laughs> no, I appreciate it, though. Yeah. Like, I do think you're right. It's like a very stepwise process. Yeah. And you're now getting to the stage where you're like, I, I got this. Yeah, I totally, think. totally. But, awesome. um, but, yeah, I mean, I think, the, I think the real point is just to get a, a bigger picture sense of what people yes. are trying to accomplish. And, and then that can kind of help inform the solution for it. My last question for you, because yeah. I will not take up any more of your time, <laughs> but I appreciate you of just course. walking me through everything. Yeah. It's more of just like, what has kind of been your favorite thing about working here or working in Chilla? Like what, what has been kind of the thing that you're like, I really like, there's nowhere else yeah. except here. Sort totally. Of thing. I mean, yeah, again, a really difficult question to answer because there's so many things that are amazing about Jilla. Yes. Um, yeah, I, mean, I understand. You know, learning every day is, is, you know, the guys that I work with, there's yeah. so many years of institutional knowledge and expertise. Yeah. And so, yeah, literally every day I learn from these guys and, and they're all just the, the, the best people, so friendly. Um, and that's true about Jilla in general. I mean, everybody is just, just amazing here. And then, you know, the variety of work every day is different. Every day is challenging and, and we're well supported. Yeah. Also, you know, like I can just focus on instrument making. I don't have to think about, you know, accounting things or all the other 
yeah. you know, all Meetings the other stuff. Or, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we really don't. We can just hang out and help people and make That's instruments, awesome. and it's great. So, yeah. yeah. I do also see sometimes students coming in and bringing their bikes in and working on their bikes. Yeah, totally. Is that something that... Stuff. Yeah. Okay. I mean, you know, not formally, you know, we're here to help people. And so, yeah, yeah really in any way, you know, and, and we've got a little, Hans has brought in some little bike repair kit for little Aww. small repairs, repairing brakes and that kind of stuff. Yeah. And we've got a couple of, of bike pumps over there. So yeah. I was just going to say, that seems like something that like you said, the support thing. Like, yeah. You're here to support people. That's our that's our modus operandi. You know, that's, yeah. that's what really gets us going is, is to just help and support the scientists. And so in any way that we can do that, we will. You know, historically, it's been even hanging shelves and stuff in the labs. Although we do less of that. Calvin just spent a week downstairs hanging some shelves. So, so, so we still do it. Yeah, really, any anything that the researchers need that we can help with, we do. And it's awesome. I thank Elsie, who points me towards where instrument maker Calvin Swandron is. Walking across the hall, I enter a room filled with bigger and more imposing machines, all looking like they belong in Iron Man's laboratory. Swandron is fiddling with one of these large machines, a metal base with a heavy glass box on top of it. Next to this contraption is a control panel with a terrifying amount of buttons. As Swandron later tells me, this special machine is a five-axis miller, brand new to the instrument shop. Since it is so new, Swadron has the privilege of trying to figure out how to program it. So we got a new Haas UMC 500, which is, yeah, pretty pretty standard, super high-tech, American-made milling machine. There's, you know, kind of a wide array of, you know, how fancy a milling machine you can get, and this one's kind of like somewhere near the middle, where, like, you know, anything much below this would be pretty wimpy or, you know, not super capable for a fairly big operation, which the Tula Instrument Shop has become over the, you know, 60 years or whatever. So sometimes we make some really big parts, sometimes we make a lot of parts. If you need something to be cheap, usually you need to scale it. You need to make lots of them. You make millions of something, you can make it pretty affordable. There's nothing that Jilla, the Jilla Instrument Shop makes a million of, and there right. won't be. And the the few things that over the years we have had, you know, everyone in the building wants, you know, dozens or hundreds of them or something like that. That stuff ends up getting made commercially. Uh, optics mounts and things like that come to mind as just like parts that the Jilla Shop used to make, and then now somebody else scales it, and that's fine. That works well. We want to do the custom stuff. We don't want to be running production. Say no to people when they come in for custom parts and custom things uh, because we're trying to run a production shop. So Yeah. So uh, I know you mentioned last time we chatted that it was in five axes. Mm-hmm. How does the five axes thing work again? Remind me. Yeah. So like a, a milling machine that you might have seen in the 1920s or something like that, <laughs> or the 1940s or whatever it is. We have a couple of those. Uh, we have some bridge ports. They're three-axis milling machines. And so those would be, those are all manual machines. This is a CNC machine, so it's computer numeric controlled. Basically, like a, an electronic motor turns the screw instead of you manually turning knobs. You can put the whole machine into a position in three-dimensional space. A cutting tool like a drill bit or an end mill or something like that in any position in XYZ uh, Cartesian coordinates. A five axis machine, you get basically all three of those axes that the head can move on and position a drill bit or a end mill on, but then your part is on what's called a trunnion, which is a, you get two rotational axes, one yeah, so I guess you have one that kind of pivots around and then one that's a rotation. So there's a okay. platter, a round platter. And so you can tip that platter at different angles or you can rotate it in endlessly, basically. So sure. you can only tip it, you can maybe tip it 30 degrees in one direction and uh, I want to say like 120 in the other direction. So okay. you can't put it all the way upside down, but that would be silly because you'd be blocking your cutting tool from getting to the part which is mounted on the platter. And then the platter can rotate, you know, 360 endlessly. You can only really position something in space and then move it to a different position very, usually very arduously. Gotcha. Uh, on a five-axis machine, you can just move all the axes at the same time. Wow. That's, the, that's where 
all of a sudden you're not just saving time and money, you're making parts that are completely impossible to make otherwise. Yeah. So that's what the five axis machine really okay. excels at. And, you know, if you see fancy, exciting parts being made by five axis <laughs> machines, like turbocharger inducers, stuff that are just like complicated angles. But if you look at it closely, it's like that would be impossible to machine because different parts of the right. tool would be hitting different parts of the part. And there's no way to get things out of the way without moving everything all at the same time. Hence the machine. Yeah. And so the machine can do that. Software in 2023 can do that. I was just going to ask, how is programming that going? Hard. It's very hard. <laughs> sure. Um, you know, we've done simple stuff. We've done some like four axis simultaneous machining. Wow. Um, which actually makes it much simpler. Okay. Adding, adding a fifth in makes it just... And I've done some three axes on that machine already. It's the same as the rest of our three axis machines, but okay. fairly straightforward. Fairly straightforward as far as transition over. Uh, we have a couple of other Haas machines, so the transition is seamless there. Set up and get running. You buy a different brand, and it can be complicated. Yeah, and and there's just an element of trust where it's like I know if I do these things in this order and program it to do this. I know it does this thing before it does this thing, and not after. And I don't have to guess and worry about what it's going to, you know, is it going to crash into this part and then move out of the way, or is it going to move out of the way and then be fine? So the software is super capable, and as soon as we start to figure out, like, the basics of it, it's really hard at first because, like, okay, this thing looks, this toolpath I'm writing looks nothing like what I need it to do. Everything is wrong. And if I change this box, it's wrong in a totally different way. Oh, no. <laughs> I, I can't tell if it's better or worse or if I'm getting my, you know, parameters closer to the right thing. I've got some intuition, or, you know, simpler programs where I can see, oh, I know what it's I know what it's trying to do. I know what it thinks it's doing, even though I don't want to do it. Gotcha. On a five axis toolpath. I could have ten different parameters wrong by you know five hundred percent wrong and I I don't know which ones need to change. <laughs> you so. have to figure them out trial and error style a little yeah, bit. Yeah, and it's kind of a nonsensical. It's like, I don't know, I bet that one's wrong. It didn't actually make it look better, but I'm still going to change it anyway. Right. Now to pivot, speaking of axes and pivoting. Uh -huh. um, could you tell me a bit about how you came here, kind of your history in the instrument shop? Yeah. So I started out studying astrophysics at CU. Uh -huh. What, 2011 I started? Yeah, so I started in astrophysics... And started getting interested in machining. I kind of always had an interest in it and went to a couple of shops around campus trying to find a job. Nobody was hiring. I found a job. A guy my dad knew who worked in a, kind of a North Boulder in a shop. So I worked there for a bit while I was in school, busting out parts, basically standing at a CNC machine. Gotcha. I didn't do any of the programming or any of the complicated stuff that I'm doing what they call operating, where somebody programs it, gets it all set up, okay. knows it's not going to crash, knows nothing's going to wrong go wrong so then they hire an operator who basically it's go yeah. part gets made you catch it put it in the pile maybe clean it off put a new piece of stock in hit go again so i did that you know many hours got to watch a machine run for many many hours yeah. <laughs> surprisingly good experience to just watch chips get made and watch what the process looks like definitely sparked the interest in cnc <laughs> machining metalworking in general yeah, and then as a, I think my senior year, my first senior year, I walked by this place, the instrument shop, going to a, a solar and space physics talk. So some, some astrophysics. Some talk. astrophysics talk that you know got advertised seemed interesting while I was in school, and I walked through the building looking for the auditorium and saw this place mm. and started poking my head around. And, hey, do you guys hire students? And at the time they said. We have three students. We only ever have three. So, you know, come back some other time, check in. And so, like, every month for the next year, I'd come in and say hi and talk to Hans. Hans would always show, show me whatever he's working on, show whoever walks by whatever he's working on, show, show me around the shop and just be like, yeah, come back, you know, keep checking in at the end of the summer or the beginning of the summer or something like that. Someone might quit. We could hire somebody new. I think somebody graduated. So, yeah, beginning of the, the last summer of my college, I started working here. And then, yeah, it became very obvious that I like the hands-on stuff. I don't have the math chops to really be a... 
yeah, to go through the whole grad student um, endeavor. And yeah, uh, astrophysics is particularly math heavy and kind of lacked all of the hands on aspect of doing science that I was excited about. Just the more I worked here, the more it's like, I like going to work. I don't want to have to go to class now. So as soon as I graduated, basically a summer off, but after that, there was an opening at the shop. Somebody had retired or somebody was lined up to retire. And so it was just kind of like perfect timing. And so there was some push to try and like convince me to... To stay. Stay, which was good because I was a little bit restless in Boulder. And I was like, ah, I don't know. Maybe I'll find some other job. But I like this job a lot. Probably shouldn't be a good job. But it was a, it was a bit hard to tell. Just by being a student in the shop, you're not you're not doing instrument making. Exactly. I hung a bunch of shelves, painted shelves, stuff like that, hanging units dry, occasionally deburring parts for somebody or something like that. It's a very different thing. Actually yeah. making stuff. Learning how to do yeah. So to kind of follow up on that, do you have a favorite particular thing you'd like to make or work with? I get accused of being a masochist around the shop. So, a masochist? So the, there's some really like unpleasant materials and unpleasant. I um, see. Anything types in particular? Yeah, I mean, like uh, learning from Kim, the the old old school tool maker. It's like the really fussy stuff, the really like ultra patient and just like you know, it's not exciting. <laughs> you just sit there and try over and over and over again, or really really worry about all the little details. I kind of like that type of work. Mostly hands-on stuff is what I get excited about. We, of course, do a lot of design. I'd, I'd rather do a little bit of light design okay. and heavier hands-on. Actual building. Yeah, that's how I'd rather spend the day. But yeah, it's a complicated parts and difficult materials, stainless, in bar, titanium, stuff like that. Nice. Do a lot of copper. Copper seems like bread and butter. For this shop at this point, yeah. since I started here, most parts that I make are made out of copper, which is not easy, despite kind of, it's a soft and simple seeming metal, but it's kind of too soft. They, people talk about it being gummy, which is just a term that doesn't mean anything until you've machined copper, and then you're like, oh, that's what you mean gummy. It's just like <laughs> mushing around and pushing places, and instead of cutting, it just moves out of the way. Yeah, so there's, there's some subtlety and nuance to machine and copper and I've done quite a bit of it now so yeah. it seems like not a difficult to machine material but I know a lot of places are not interested in machine and copper. They'd rather do aluminum, mild steel. People don't like working with stainless steel. Those are the things we do all the time. Vacuum chambers are all stainless steel, flanges, stuff like that. Basically a lot of times magnetic materials are simple and normal to machine. And Jilla just can't really have magnetic materials in any lab anywhere. You're right. So that's where a lot of the complicated stuff comes in. It's just like, oh, by the way, it can't be magnetic. Of course. Is it nice having all the guys kind of in one spot together that you can ask questions and tag team off of a little bit? Yeah, I lean super heavily on the other guys. Somebody somebody with a bigger ego may say like, oh, I don't want to you know, ask people how to do something. I want to figure it out myself. I ask every single person how to do everything. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's like, I have an idea of how I want to do this, but I'm still going to ask you and see what you're thinking or how you would approach it. And it's really informative. And a lot of times people, you know, one person is like, oh, I'm actually really worried about this aspect. Huh, I haven't really considered how that might be a huge problem. And other people come up with something super clever that it's like, ah, that would actually work really well. And sometimes nobody has any ideas and <laughs> I have to just figure it out myself. But at least I feel better about not knowing how to do it because nobody else knows how to do it either. Right. You're all stuck. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's just a difficult problem. So what does your week kind of look like for this week or maybe a typical week as far as like projects that you'd be working on? <laughs> Honestly, I don't know. I think tomorrow we're scheduled. James and I are going to go to NIST. We have to figure out how to move a laser table that has lasers on it down the hall. So we're going to go check that out. I haven't been over to NIST yet. We make a lot of NIST parts, but I haven't been there and seen the place. First tour. Yeah, so I've got a visitor pass lined up for me. But that shouldn't be... I don't think we're going to actually move the table. We're kind of looking at the details, making sure it's... Oh yeah, it'll clear this corner, but... Oh wait, there's a fire alarm in the way or something like right. that. So try and, try and take some measurements and stuff. 
today we're James and I were also moving a laser table in Jilla. Okay. <laughs> So there's some shuffling happening, it seems. That seems really, it sounds really tricky because it's so delicate, right? Yeah, they're delicate. Obviously, you can't drop it. Right. <laughs> you can't <laughs> drop anything ever. <laughs> Nothing is droppable around here. But more than that, they're just, they're really heavy. And so it's its a heavy thing in almost always a really tight space around really sensitive stuff. So the one we're working on now doesn't have anything on it, but right behind you in every direction there's sensitive stuff. I, I kind of enjoy that. I just like the rigging, the moving heavy stuff in really precarious and difficult situations. Definitely when I started, I thought it was weird that people would come to the instrument shop and they're like, hey, will you just carry my laser for me? You can't pick it up yourself? They're like, oh no, it's half a million dollars. It's like, oh, why do you want me to pick it up? You're obviously well qualified. <laughs> I don't know where that qualification came from because the first time somebody said that it's like okay so you want me to do it and they're like yeah and it's like huh i guess if i break it don't feel better or something i don't right, know right right <laughs> but um on top of that i think my track record now of oh. not breaking anything has qualified me because oh. i don't usually break anything <laughs> you need the sign that's like zero days without accident or something yeah no it, for you it's the opposite it'd be it'd be a lot of days yeah <laughs> <laughs> usually we're you know, slow and meticulous. Yeah, I don't know. The first the first couple of super expensive things I had to move, it's like, why? <laughs> now that I've done it, sure, I see it. Yeah. I've done it before. I know how to do it. I also haven't broken things. Yeah. Gotcha. At the beginning, it was kind of just like, oh, you look like an instrument maker. Come pick up this. We've got to carry this dilution refrigerator on a chain hoist. It's like, okay. Uh, as far as leaning on people in the instrument shop that's definitely not one that i'll just walk up to and start moving as a you know recent college graduate but hans of course helps yeah really hans did it and i help him but nowadays if i'm even a little bit uncomfortable about a situation it's like i don't know let me see if i can find hans and he'll just take a look at it and either tell me it's okay or be like eh, i don't know if i would trust that eye bolt or something like that it's like okay okay gonna lean on Hans as much as I possibly can. It, it seems like, I mean, I know him and Kim are the old, oldest ones here. Mm -hmm. It seems like he's more of a mentor figure to all of you. Is that fair to say? Hans is a mentor figure to everyone, I would say. Okay. Not to not to undermine Hans's influence on me, but Kim, I go to Kim for all Absolutely. sorts of stuff. Yeah. So I, I know that most people don't feel that way, but I in particular find myself asking Kim how to do everything every day. He doesn't do as much rigging these days, but for for machining stuff in particular. I go to Kim and Hans for everything. Right. <laughs> um, so yeah, both of those guys definitely mentors for me over the last eight years or whatever I've been here. That kind of leads into my last question, which is, and you've touched on it a little bit before, but you know, what are some of your favorite things about working here and why here in particular? I mean, those guys, all those guys, five other instrument makers, Everybody's great. Everybody's super talented, motivated. There's so much to learn from, especially Kim and Hans, who have been doing this just you know, longer than I've been alive. Having them around has been crucial for me learning anything around here. Early on, started figuring out just how much there is to learn from them and how much I don't know. And It's always shocking to ask a question where you're like, this is so far out of the category of scientific instrument making. There's no way either of these guys are going to know much about it. And it's just like, they're experts already, it feels. It's it's a little bit... It was frustrating at first to be, you know, I can I can tell if someone's bullshitting, and these guys just aren't. They just actually know everything. Yeah. <laughs> and they'll tell you if they don't know. They do know almost everything about everything. So that's a, not only a super useful thing to have around is people who know everything, but also it's something to aspire to be is like, you know, I want to actually know about a li at least a little bit about a lot of different things. Know enough to hopefully not get myself into trouble. Right. <laughs> like, I don't have to know everything about every type of plumbing fitting or something like that, but I do want to know a little bit about all of them. And another reminder of just like how long it takes to learn all this stuff. It's not instant at it's all. It's not instant. And it's like, yeah, I learn a lot every day and they've been learning a lot every day for a lot more days than I have. Yeah. So you can just keep at it. Just keep learning. 
Yeah, so I, I think that that's you know one of the things that separates this place from other places is just the how much variety there is, how much stuff there is that we get to interact with and learn about, how much there is to learn. I wave goodbye to Schwadron and find myself returning to the glass shop, where I bump into instrument maker Hans Green. You've probably already noticed that Green has been featured in a lot of narratives from the other instrument makers. That's because he's been in the instrument shop for over three decades. Through that time, he's seen some exciting changes and helped to mentor the current staff of instrument makers. Green is currently working on a glass project that requires some glass blowing. After recording, he walks me through some glass blowing basics and even lets me bend some of the glass pieces around the shop. With his years of experience, Green seems to always be dispensing wisdom to those who walk through the instrument shop's door. And my interview with him is no different. So my first question for you is like, since you're kind of one of the oldest members here yeah. and you're actually featured in a lot of people's narratives as like, you're the one who brought them in. Oh, nice. um, I would just love to hear like how you got started here and like what sort of your role has been. I think it's similar to a lot of the younger people in the shop. I was a student at CU and I met somebody who ran a similar shop to Jilla's down in the engineering department. And I was really interested in it, and I got hired there as a student worker, just cleaning machines and, and learning about machining, and I really loved it. And then from working there, I learned that Jilla had an apprenticeship program, and that sounded exciting, and so I applied for that apprenticeship, um, and the timing just worked out well. They were looking for an apprentice, which only happens every few years. And I knew David Alkenberger, who had worked down in that engineering shop, and he had since come to Jilla, and so he was a connection for me here. But it was kind of just being a, a college student on campus is really what uh, how I found my way to becoming an instrument maker. I was really lucky, yeah. How, and how long have you been in 32, the shop? I think 32 years now. 32 years? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So how, what has been kind of maybe the biggest change for you since you started here? Jilla has gotten physically bigger, more right. people, yeah. but the, the culture has stayed really good. But the biggest change, let's see, I suppose it's really the rise of computer-controlled machining. Um, it's allowed us to do a lot more, a lot more of what used to be trial and error of making parts. We can now do that on the computer. It's really satisfying to make really accurate 3D models uh, figure out what fits where, uh, and then make make parts from that model. And that's been a fun and really a, a really helpful advance for science, too. What has been kind of your, your favorite thing to make over the years? Or do I've, you have a favorite? Uh, you know, I've really, I've enjoyed, there are a couple things I've really enjoyed. I enjoy all the different kinds of materials we get to machine. But I think my favorite has been learning to machine hard materials like glass and sapphire and ceramics. Wow use similar techniques just the tools are a little different so instead of hard steel tools or um, these tungsten carbide tools where you're kind of shaving off slices of material we use tools that are coated with diamond and it, it's more like um, a sandpaper action you're removing the material as a powder but you can still machine really sophisticated shapes and and using the same kind of tools that we use for other materials same kind of machine tools different cutting tools how often do you end up working with glass or sapphire? We probably do that stuff, oh, I'm guessing for me, it's probably every couple months or so I get to make something out of glass or sapphire. Okay. Uh, we also do some glass blowing here, and I enjoy doing that. It's How really... often do, does that happen? That doesn't happen that. as often. Uh, maybe every six months or so we have some glass blowing project, and that's come and gone. In the early days of doing the atom trapping experiments, there were these bigger glass structures that were used to make little to make vacuum chambers that were then used to trap these atoms. And that process has now been kind of figured out and miniaturized to where we're not making as many of these glass cells or little vacuum chambers. It's also kind of fun. Some of the glass work is related to vacuum tubes, which is pretty old technology, right. but it's still some of that technology is still relevant to the kind of science that we do here. Not the vacuum tubes themselves, <laughs> but the glass work and the electronics within the glass okay. uh, using similar materials and techniques. Wow. So we have a book about how to, how to build vacuum tubes, and that book that turns out to be really useful. 
because we're using similar materials and techniques. That, and that's kind of what I've seen from the rest of the guys is some of these older methods that you might think are outdated actually are more important and relevant than today than like when they first started do you think that's the case like we're still using some of the older methods to make everything yeah and some of those methods come back again you know that was the vacuum tubes are one example we have some machinery that was used i guess it was also i was gonna say it was different but no that was also used for making vacuum tubes but we have a a machine for making a special kind of welding machine that sits in the corner for months if not years at a time (laughs) And then someone will go, I need to do this thing. And I was like, oh, yeah, we have a machine to do this. Okay. So that's something unusual about the Jilla Instrument Shop is that we don't make one product. So we don't have like a, we're not like a, a factory that's good at making things out of sheet metal or good at making machined parts out of, out of a certain kind of metal. We make stuff out of glass, plastic, ceramic. And so we have tools to do all this different kind of work. Sometimes those tools will sit for months or years, but they become relevant when a research moves in some direction where they need something different. It almost sounds like you guys are like a studio of artists in a way, like everybody has their own expertise. It is kind and, of like that. And everybody comes to you with like a different project that you might have to tackle yeah. in, a, in a different way. What's been kind of the weirdest, maybe, or, or most uh, surprising, perhaps, project that somebody's brought to you and said, hey, I need this done? The... Uh, the one that comes to mind is a project where there was a group that was trying to do some research using potassium vapor at very high temperatures. Oh, wow. So very high temperatures mean about 800 degrees Celsius, and that's where metals, where materials are actually glowing red. Not bright red, but it'd be like looking at a burner on your stove. That's about that temperature. And potassium vapor is really corrosive at room temperature, and it's extremely corrosive at those temperatures. Corrosive in that it attacks most metals and most glasses. I mentioned those too because they wanted to use laser beams to go into a tube that contained this high temperature potassium and bounce the laser beam off of that potassium and study it. But we did find that this was possible by using titanium and sapphire. So sapphire windows are uh, clear. You can start shine a laser beam through them. And the potassium vapor would not attack the sapphire. And then we used titanium metal, and it, was, it also stood up pretty well to the, to the uh, very high temperature potassium. And we learned about these kind, of, these kind of seals between potassium and titanium because of research that was done into street lamps which use uh, sodium or mercury at high temperatures. And potassium was similar, and it, and it turns out some of that technology and research worked well for the thing we were doing. It's amazing. Yeah, so we spent a few years making different <laughs> iterations of these things. And, and it sounds like there's always something new to tackle in here. Right? Always new challenges, and, and that's why I've, I've, I mean, I still enjoy coming to work, and I still get, I still get that kind of, new job ner- nervousness you know when you you go to a new job you're like oh, i don't know how to do this it's all new and that's kind of a neat feeling and we yeah. still get that people ask us to do something we're like uh, we don't really know how but well i think we can figure it out Absolutely. and having working with five other really talented people is really helpful yeah. uh, i think it's a lot harder if you work in a small there are university shops where there are one or two people mm-hmm. and those are great but it's much better to have more people when you have to figure out something new Everybody has different ideas and different approaches, and we do a lot of collaboration uh, between projects. That actually leads into my next question, which is, you know, everybody here has been here for a few years at least. You have this really close camaraderie. How does that kind of play into maybe like making something? Like, do you guys tag team? Do you pass off projects? Do you each have your own specialty that, you know, you do this thing and somebody else does a different thing? Like, how does that sort of play into to the whole entire shop? It's a combination of all of what you just mentioned. Someone will come to any of us. Anybody can come in the door anytime and just talk to us about a project. And if it's a big project, we'll we'll write up some notes on it and start it at some time in the future. And that project will be assigned to one person in the shop. But uh, if it's a big enough project, it may be more than one, but usually just one person. But that one person will go to other people to get advice if you need help with it. So there's a lot of... Uh, 
we usually know what each other are working on and and sometimes we'll offer suggestions unsolicited which is also <laughs> which is also fun it's like hey I, what about doing it this way mm-hmm. and people are mostly really receptive to that and that's fun and so what is kind of your favorite part about working here i think it is not just in the shop that we have a really good culture and a really good rapport with one another but all of jilla has this culture of um of both being accepting but also curious and collaborating with each other you know if we're doing something if for instance if i if my if i have a machine and i end up breaking it it's like uh and it has some electrical problem i can go talk to one of the the electrical the one of the people in the electrical shop computer problem we have a great computing facility and and just everywhere you know from just janitors that say hi to you in the morning to administrative tasks that you don't even know about that get done that uh, keep the place moving efficiently. So I guess it's just the culture of the Institute has always been really, um, it hasn't been as fractured as I think a lot of organizations get. It's been very um, cooperative. Nice. And that's stayed that way for decades. And it's really, it's a fun place to come to work Yeah. because of that. So I have heard a rumor that there is somewhat of a bike repair shop in the instrument shop. <laughs> can you confirm or deny these rumors? I can absolutely confirm it. Yeah, okay, just, you can confirm yes. them. Now, so, how often do you have people come in and, and use that part of the instrument shop? Well, the, the graduate students have a shop where they can come work any time of the day or night. And of course, graduate students, they often have bikes, you know, just like any other college student. But most of the people in the shop also ride bikes. And so we have a set of bike tools and a bike stand and some knowledge of our past experience with those bikes. So we are happy to help people work on their bikes. And what we tell anybody who comes to work in the shop at Jilla is, you know, if you want to make stuff for yourself, this is actually good for the Institute. And it's also bike repair is the same thing. Anything that can increase your knowledge of mechanical things is going to make you a better experimental scientist. And uh, that's kind of the goal of the Institute. So it's, uh, it's sort of um, a roundabout way of getting there, but working on bikes is also excellent. Yeah, you, yeah. you shift their mindset a little bit, right? right? How yeah. they see the problem. Yeah. That actually kind of leads into my, my final question for you, Hans, which is, you know, if somebody comes in and they want you to work on something, do you have any recommendations for people when they want to work with the instrument shop, whether that's, you know, talking with them one-on-one or saying, you know, try your hand at CAD or whatever? Uh-huh. Like, what what sort of advice would you give somebody? My advice to anybody, and are you asking about sort of like researchers and graduate students? Yeah. or yes. yes. So my advice is come ask lots of questions. Okay. You know, we are a shop. I think a lot of people are intimidated by professional shops it's like going to get your car worked on you don't just sort of waltz in when someone's working on a car and say hey you know what's show me something about that transmission but here it's different we want people to walk through that door anytime and ask us questions or say hey can you come look at something in the lab because we're here to make the science go smoother and um, and that's really doesn't matter what that is or if that definition needs to change we change so we, uh, we want people to just come through the door, ask, ask us questions, and also, even if it's just like, hey, I'm new to the place, how does this, how does this place work? Yeah. And we're happy to show them around. So, and awesome. uh, yeah, we want people to, there are two reasons for that. I think it, we want to be helpful in the science, but we also want to create that culture where you can come in and ask us about things, but also especially important for graduate students to not feel like they are alone and overwhelmed uh, that there's lots of places for help and you can ask anybody yeah absolutely because so, it's a it's a tough career uh, you're asked to do many many things under a lot of pressure and if we can help relieve some of that pressure or just make the day a little better we want to do that yeah that actually kind of inspired an, another question I have for you, which is, you know, since you've been here so long, obviously you've done so many different machining parts. Uh-huh. Do you have a particular sense of pride, maybe, if you if you see a part in a lab and you're like, I made that, or like this, this you know, atomic clock has my little cog in here that I made yes. or something? Like, do you have anything specific that comes to mind if you think about a piece that you're really proud of? I think some of the early atom trapping experiments, it was really fun being involved with some of those. And some of those are still in use. I say early, you know, maybe 20 years ago. 
but I guess even as recent as five or ten years ago, we were still making some of those, some different. That's not true. We're always making parts for the Adam Trapping Express. <laughs> but some of these glass, yeah. So specifically, some of the little glass vacuum chambers. It's really fun to see them, and it's especially fun to see those in the lab where you have lasers all around. And here's this little tiny glass thing in the middle of all these lasers, and there may be a little glowing ball of light in there. So it's it's exciting to see that. But on the other end, often parts that I've that I've really sweated over and worried about will end up in the metal recycling dumpster. Oh no! <laughs> and that is to- and I'm totally fine with that because that's the way science works, right? Mm-hmm. It's like, hey, you know, we either extracted everything we could from this part and we've moved on to the next uh, next version, or this one just didn't work. And so I, when I was earlier in my career, I'd see that and go, oh, that's just kind of disappointing. But now it's just like, this is great. You know, it yeah. served its purpose and now it's going to go get melted into something else. Thank you for listening to Humans of Jilla, a Jilla podcast. Be sure to subscribe to Jilla's YouTube channel or Spotify channel for more information and to keep listening to these episodes. This episode features Jilla's instrument makers, Kyle Thatcher, Hans Green, Adam Elzey, Kim Hagen, Calvin Schwadron, and James Urich. Production design, sound design, and research by Kenny Hughes Castleberry, with assistance from Jilla's science communication office and Jilla's instrument shop. Sounds and music by Pixabay and Kevin MacLeod. Jilla is a joint institute between NIST and the University of Colorado Boulder. This podcast is hosted by Jilla. Any use of this podcast without Jilla's permission or credit is prohibited.